Welcome back, everyone. Today we continue our lecture on consumer theory, and you'll recall that there were three elements we were interested in. Preferences, budgets, and choice. So now that we've explored what makes up individual preferences, we can start to talk about the other element that will eventually lead to a consumer. How much money we have. And recall that we started the last lecture talking about different baskets of different goods. In this case, we're talking about a basket with both food and clothing. Now, certainly we have different preferences over food and clothing, but there's another element at play, which is how much money we have and how much food and clothing cost. Mathematically, what that'll look like is the price of food times the amount of food plus the price of clothing times the amount of clothing, and I'll put little dots here to represent that multiplication, needs to sum up to how much money we have. In this case, if we have 80 bucks, regardless of what our preferences are, assuming we still prefer more to less, remember that assumption from last time, our total spending should equal that income. In this case, if the price of food is one, $1 for a unit of food and $2 for a unit of clothing, any market basket that meets this budget constraint, any market basket where we spend all our money needs to follow this budget equation, F plus 2C equals $80. And remember, we haven't brought preferences into play yet. We're just talking about what is affordable. What is this set of market baskets? So if a unit of clothing is $2, we can spend all our money on clothing. That'll get 40 units of clothing at $2 a piece equals $80. That's here in market basket A. Alternatively, if a unit of food is $1, we can spend all our money on food. 80 units of food equals $80. And there's any number of market baskets in between. 60 units of food and 10 units of clothing, 20 units of food, and 30 units of clothing, and so on and so forth. What this looks like when we translate it graphically is a straight downward sloping line. And it represents us spending all of our possible income, in this case $80, dollars $80, on any combination, any possible combination of food and clothing. And remember, for this purposes, we're assuming that food and clothing are the only two goods in the world. Thus, this budget line describes all possible efficient combinations. And by efficient, I mean we're spending our entire income. Certainly, we could buy 10 units of clothes and 20 units of food, but that would result in leftover income. And since this is, there's no future in this model and there are no other goods in this model, all we're doing is sacrificing utility, which we talked about in the last lecture. So let's talk about the mechanics of this budget line. And remember, when we talk about straight lines, we're concerned with sort of two things in general, and those two things help us describe the line. We're concerned with the slope and the intercept. So the slope of the budget line, the rate of change, is just the relative prices of those two goods. The price of food relative to the price of clothing. So here we have an equation, change in clothing over change in food, that's minus one half. It's also the price of food, one, over the price of clothing, two, and we have that minus sign in front because it's downward sloping. We're also concerned with points on the line. And the easiest way to find a point on the line is to look at the intercept. Remember, two points determine a line. So what are our two intercepts here? And how do they we interpret them economically? Well, it's just our income over the price of the good on that axis. So in this case, our income, remember, is $80 and the price of clothing is $2 a unit. 
So if we're spending all our income on clothing, we intercept the clothing axis at 40 units. Alternatively, if we're spending all our income on food, which costs $1 a unit, we intersect the food axis at 80 units. And all those market baskets we described on the last slide, we can find here on this budget line. Now this is a static model, but we're interested in using it to explore dynamic elements. In this case, changes in income and changes in price. And here on this slide, we'll talk about changes in income. Remember, in econ, we like to use this modeling assumption of all else equals certeris paribus, but that's only powerful to the extent that we explore things that are not equal when things change. So how does the budget line change when either prices or income change? Take a minute to think about what you might, what, what you might think happens on your own, and then we'll, we'll regroup in a second and explore it. When income changes, the entire budget line is going to shift. Why might that be the case? Well, remember, what we know is points and slope determine a line. And the slope of the line is the ratio of prices, the relative prices. Relative prices haven't changed in this example. What's changed is income. And remember, income determines our intercepts of the line. So previously we were here on this middle line where income is $80. And so we intercepted the clothing axis at income over the price of clothing, which was $2 a unit, giving us an intercept of 40 here. And on the food axis, income over the price of food, which was $1 a unit. So we intercept the axis here at 80 units of food. So what happens if all of a sudden we're earning $160 instead of $80? And remember, we're spending all our money on some combination of these two goods. More is better than less. That's our preference assumption. So if our income has gone up to $160. Income over the price of clothing here on this axis, 160 over two, is gonna intersect the axis at 80. And income over the price of food here on this axis, 160 over one, we're gonna intercept the axis at 160. In other words, when our income increases, our budget line we have a parallel shift out. Alternatively, our income might fall. In this case, what if income falls to $40? Going through that same process, our intercepts are going to change, in this case get smaller, and our budget line shifts in. Of course, changes in income are not the only way this system can change. We can also explore how one individual price change affects our budget constraint. So before we explore this both graphically and mathematically, take a minute on your own to think about what happens when the price of one good changes. And in this case, we'll talk about the, the price change in terms of food. What do you think will happen to our budget line? Where a change in income caused a parallel shift in the budget line, a change in relative prices or the change in one price relative to the other is going to cause a rotation of the budget line. We see here that it's either shifting in or out, and I'm drawing these sort of clockwise and counterclockwise arrows. So what happens, for instance, if food gets cheaper? Previously, food was $1 a unit. What happens if now food is 50 cents a unit? We still have that same income of $80, but what's happened is the intercept on the food axis has changed. In this case, if food is now 50 cents a unit and we still have an income of $80, then 80 over 1 half equals 160. If the price of food changes and we're still and we're spending all our money on clothes, the clothing intercept hasn't changed. So what that looks like is a rotation out 
of our budget line. And this is because the slope of our budget line is determined by the relative prices. In this case, we've got a relative price of one half for a unit of food, over two for a unit of clothing. We put a minus sign because it's downward sloping. The slope of minus one fourth. So our intercept on this clothing axis hasn't changed, but our slope has changed, and our intercept on our food axis has changed. Alternatively, if food gets more expensive, if the price goes from $1 for a unit of food to $2 for a unit of food, our budget line rotates in. And here you'll notice that the price of food is the same as the price of clothing, so we're going to have a slope of minus 1 and we're going to have equal intercepts. Now that we've explored these two components of consumer theory, our preferences and our budget, we can start to explore the choices we'll make conditional on these two items. And to do so, we're going to make explicit two assumptions that we, we've been hinting at this whole time. Our Utility maximizing, so I'll put U max. Our utility maximizing choice is going to satisfy two conditions. One, it must be on the budget line. More is better than less, and the only goods in this world are the goods that our budget is made out of, food and clothing in this case. And two, it must be our most preferred combination. Remember, utility is just a mathematical representation of our preferences, and we're trying to find the utility maximizing choice. So how do we maximize utility? How do we maximize consumer satisfaction? We just match those two things. So it has to be on our budget line. Sure, D looks like it would give us more utility than baskets A or B, but we can't afford D, it's past our budget line. So of all the possible baskets on this budget line, we want the one that puts us on the highest indifference curve, which hopefully you can see graphically here is gonna be basket A. Graphically, this means our indifference curve is tangent to our budget line. And mathematically, and we'll explore this more in the next slide, this means that our marginal rate of substitution is equal to the price ratio. Now let's think conceptually why this might be the case. And to do so, let's consider price, or let's consider market basket B over here. Here at market basket B, to maintain the same level of utility, to maintain the same level of satisfaction, we are willing to give up 10 units of clothing to gain 10 units of food. But at our current income level and at this current ratio of prices, if we give up 10 units of clothing, we can afford more than 10 units of food. And so at this current level of utility, at this market basket B, we can buy additional units of satisfaction without sacrificing income that we don't have. And that should make sense to you. Remember, in econ, we're concerned with this equimarginal principle. We're concerned with equating marginal benefit with marginal cost. And in terms of individual satisfaction, that looks like where our marginal rate of substitution equals the price ratio. This is because the marginal rate of substitution is essentially our marginal benefit. How much satisfaction we're getting from consuming food relative to clothing or vice versa and the marginal cost is essentially that price ratio. What do we have to give up to consume that? So let's make the, the mathematics in that last slide a little bit more explicit, which is if we're staying on the same indifference curve, the marginal utility we gain for consuming some additional units of food must be equal to the marginal utility we lose by giving up 
uh, some additional units of clothing. In other words, by staying on the same indifference curve, the change in utility is zero. So from here, we can rearrange what these, this equation looks like by bringing the relative changes over to one side and the ratio of marginal utility to the other. But we already know what some of these things look like. The ratio of marginal utilities is the marginal rate of substitution and the ratio of changes is the, the price ratio. So in other words, the equimarginal principle states that the marginal rate of substitution must be equal to the ratio of price changes. And to solve for our most preferred bundle, we just have to follow that equimarginal principle and equate marginal rate of substitution to the price ratio. So to find our most preferred bundle, we need to be both on the budget line and the basket that gives us the most satisfaction on that budget line. And a few slides ago, we said that was the basket that lies tangent to the curve, but that's not always the case. Sometimes we'll be at what's known as a corner solution, and that's where we spend all our budget on one good or the other. In this case, you'll see that the market basket that spends all our money that gives us the most satisfaction is spending all our money on ice cream relative to frozen yogurt. If you've watched the TV show The Good Place, they'll say that frozen yogurt is something people kind of like, but is also kind of a bummer. We'd rather spend our money on ice cream. Now, in practice, what this means is when we're checking for our most preferred solutions, we need to also check the corners. But we might have some shortcuts here, and maybe we'll talk about this in class, but stop for a minute and think about what we know about preferences, and if there's any type of preferences in particular that you think might result in corner solutions. So historically, we went from cardinal utility, where we can compare the distance between utility measures, to ordinal utility, where we're just concerned with ranks, to revealed preference, and we've also started to do that here in our lecture, where first we had a measure of your preferences, a numerical measure. From there, we went to just the most preferred basket. We know that utility level two is more than utility level one, but we don't know what that looks like. But now we can start to explore what happens when we just observe choices. And that's this revealed preference approach we talked about last lecture. And this approach is really powerful because I don't need to know anything about your underlying preferences. I just need to know the prices and your choice. So what I have here is a definition that says, if one consumer chooses one market basket over the other, and the chosen market basket is more expensive than the alternative, the consumer must prefer the chosen market basket. But that's not quite right. What we should say is at least as. So if one consumer chooses a market basket over another and the chosen basket is at least as expensive as the alternative, the consumer must prefer the chosen market basket. So here we see a consumer with budget line L1 and they pick basket A over basket B. And since basket B is on that same budget line L1, knowing what we know about preferences, if we assume this is a rational consumer, why would you choose something you prefer less? It must be that A is giving them more utility. In other words, market basket A is revealed preferred to B. Similarly, suppose we're, placing, we're facing a different budget line, in this case L2, where both B and D are affordable, and I'll switch the pen color real quick, where both B and D are affordable on this budget line L2, we can't afford market basket A anymore. And now this consumer picks market basket B, it must be the case that they prefer B to D. 
finally, because we believe in the transitive property, since we prefer A to B and B to D, it must be the case that we also prefer A to D. Graphically, what this looks like is all A is preferred to any possible basket in this green shaded area. We don't know anything about this consumer's preferences. We've just observed their budget and their choice. Similarly, when we look at this pink shaded area, we know that A is the least preferred here because we have this assumption that more is preferred to less. As we observe more and more choices with more and more budget sets, we can start to trace out this consumer's preferences without knowing anything about them other than their choices and their budgets. By just exploiting these assumptions that more is preferred to less and preferences are transitive. So now if we see in budget line L3 that they pick market basket E, E must be reveal preferred to A, and in budget line L4, if they pick market basket G, G must be reveal preferred to A. So whereas A is preferred to all these green areas, E and G are both preferred to A, and certainly more is preferred to less. So now the pink area looks like areas that are less preferred than A, and the green area, or, or, sorry, the pink area looks like area areas that are more preferred than A, and the green area, A, we prefer A over those areas, and we've started to trace out what might look like a preference ordering. 